Hello there. You are uh, in a little teaching module called The Nature of Scientific Inquiry. You should actually have this sheet and the idea is you and all your wisdom um, are asked to write down pithy little information as to what each of these science processes are. They are important in the sense that throughout the entire course you need to be able to use them. In order to use them, you need to be able to understand them. I mean, in the past, in the days before a flipped classroom, I would actually present each one in class and people would be copying it down. Some would be copying it down, others wouldn't be. And guess what would happen? Uh, you just basically had a whole lot of time drawn out where people that were with you um, were getting bored because I had to wait for other people to catch up and then uh, you know it just became an obvious situation where hey wouldn't it be better if I just presented this online and you at your leisure um, hopefully in class and not at home none of this stuff should be done at home people the reason you need a laptop is because you are supposed to use class time to go through the actual learning experiences and you will have the benefit therefore of having me there to help you with any questions that you have rather than doing it at home right so again you have lives that are important people at home that are important your family you should spend time with them you should be active in your life get out there and run and climb mountains and do all those good things but in order to do that at some point or other you do have to go through these learning experiences they're called bobby talks uh, yeah i like the idea because you if you need it can go back and just stop replay listen to it three times if you don't care about school one little bit you don't even have to listen to it at all of course that has its consequences too so anyhow make sure you've got this sheet we will start with the nature of scientific inquiry go through the terms and uh, we'll come back probably in another little bobby talks and deal with the hypothesis material okay let's take a look at some of these science process skills it's not so much a matter of you memorizing all of these, observing, comparing, classifying, inferring, etc. It's more a matter of, hey, this is what you're doing when you do science. So in a semester, you're doing a lot of science. I'm one of these old fashioned people that believe that you can't really think about something um, until you have the words, the vocabulary to actually think about it with. And if you can't think about it, then you probably can't use it. So again, um, I will make this available in the non-video format. You can go through it again if you need to. The idea of writing it down is just, hey, the studies show that if you write stuff down, your brain is somehow forced to process it and in processing it, hopefully you remember it. So, let's go. Y'all ready for this? So, the first uh, process would be one that you have often come across in science. It's simply called observation and a definition might be watching or examining carefully by using your five senses. Notice there are two types of observation. One of them is qualitative. What does that mean? Qualitative observations are looking at properties that supply information about appearance, smell, taste, feel, or sound of an object. In other words, your senses. Uh, if you're describing in a chemistry experiment that uh, something changes color, obviously if you say it goes from blue to clear, that is an observation that is qualitative. If you notice that heat is generated, you feel the heat, uh, that is a qualitative observation. We don't encourage you to taste anything in the lab, so you might want to avoid that. The other kind of observation would be quantitative, and as the name and the root suggests, quantity it basically uses numbers and scientists love numbers. Uh, quantitative observations are properties that answer the question how much or is the result of exact measurement. In any type of scientific experiment you can do, the more scientific quantitative data you can gather, tables of numbers, that kind of data, the better. 
Okay, I've got to show you something that I have basically passed around. Well, not really passed around. I've carried this around every year for a lot of years in the classroom. And I've asked a simple question. I've said, okay, just by observing, can you tell me which one of these little balls on the stand is most massive? This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And I would go back and forth in front of every single student and they would all stare at it and they would all ponder it and they'd say, I think it's this one, the biggest one. Or they'd say, no, it's a trick question. I think it's this one. And I'd say, are you observing? And they'd look at it and they'd stare at it and they'd say, yeah, it's probably this one. Um, I don't think in 30 some years of teaching I've ever had a student actually reach out and say, let me pick it up and they actually test it right um, so this is one of the dangers of simply thinking that observation is just using your eyes observation is using all your senses so when you reach out and you actually pick these up you can detect the mass and guess what this one is the most massive and you wouldn't know that unless you'd actually use the sense of touch actually picked it up and tested for yourself uh, it's a good lesson just to keep in mind. Of course, tasting, number one, you wouldn't want to taste any of these. Number two, tasting in a lab is not a good idea at all. So the next process might be something called an observational study. Sounds very similar to observation. This is a scientific inquiry made through observations of a subject in a structured way that does not interfere with or influence the subject. So there's lots of science that is done that is outside a laboratory. I mean, most of the biological sciences, ecological sciences, you can't study uh, the white rhino very well in a laboratory. Um, can't study flocks of geese. You actually have to go out there and uh, place yourself in the environment where an animal lives and observe it without causing any type of uh, change to the animal's normal behavior. So you have things called blinds that say hunters use to hide in the wild and the same type of thing happens with scientists who would position themselves in an environment and keep track of data around them. And from that data then you can come to some kind of a conclusion. Anytime you do science, you really are very much playing with variables. A variable is any factor that could affect the result of an experiment. Um, sometimes these could be temperature, age, sex, etc. You have a sheet called doing science. That doing science sheet is basically looking at a scenario where we come up with a question. We say, there are so many fertilizers out there. Uh, chemicals that contain elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, which by the way those three little numbers on your big bag of fertilizer, that is essentially the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus, potassium. Each of those elements has incredibly good things and important things to do for a plant. So the question is which one is the most effective? The variable that we'd be looking at in that experiment is the fertilizer, right? So any factor, fertilizer in this case. Um, in that experiment, the independent variable is the variable that you are changing. It's the one you're in control of. Uh, graphically, if you are graphing your plant's growth uh, and comparing it with the different fertilizers used on various plants, um, you would be in control of which fertilizer you give each plant. So there would be no fertilizer, which would be a control. There would be fertilizer B going to this plant and fertilizer A going to this one. Of course, in your scenario, I think you're supposed to have five different plants. So you probably have five different bar graphs here representing their growth in centimeters. Notice, by the way, on the y-axis, um, you always include the units. Same thing with the x-axis in this particular case, of course, fertilizer type. There are no units for that. So that's the independent variable. So somewhere deep in the recesses of your mind, make sure you are actually comfortable with the word independent. It's the one you control. You're the scientist, you're the experimenter. This is in contrast to the dependent variable. That's the variable that is actually changing. 
on the y-axis we actually have plant growth every day you come in and you take your little ruler and you measure the stem and you say okay this one's 12 centimeters today this one was eight centimeters eventually you come to the conclusion that fertilizer a is probably more effective uh, and you record all this data right so again independent variable is the fertilizer type dependent variable is the plant growth of course there are other variables that are happening in an experiment like this and there's always other variables problem is in science you have to make sure you're controlling all those other variables so you can actually focus on the one variable you're interested in so variables in an experiment that are kept constant or unchanged are the controlled variables so in this particular scenario this experiment that we're looking at where you have five different plants and you compare the effect of fertilizer on their growth you have to make sure that you control things like the type of plant. There's no point in giving fertilizer to a cactus and a fern and expecting them to have the, the same growth characteristics. The same could be said for the amount of sunlight. If you stick one of your plants under a box and another one you expose to sunlight, again, that's a different variable. That's a different experiment. When you get to the end of the experiment, do you think it's the fertilizer that had the effect or do you think it's the effect of sunlight? So unless you're controlling for those variables, you don't know and you don't have a very effective experiment. By the way, a lot of experiments that are done are not controlled and yet the conclusions that people come to uh, seem very realistic, right? So be careful always when you're examining experiments, ask yourself what are the controlled variables. In this particular experiment, again, you have to make sure you have the same soil. You can't stick one plant in a bunch of clay type soil and another one in really healthy soil. You're going to get different results and obviously plants need water the same amount of water you can't give one plant no water and the other one basically leave in your bathtub water is another variable so just because you control those variables you do need to make sure that there's some <clears throat> plant that you can use for comparison when you look at your overall experiment so we get to the end of our experiment we have all these beautiful plants that we gave fertilizer B. How do we know that it's fertilizer B that has had the effect? We have to be able to compare to a plant that has had no fertilizer. So these would be our control, in this case, a plant with no fertilizer. And there might be, of course, C, D, E, Jack of the Beanstalk plants for a particular type of fertilizer. Uh, but the point is you always need to be able to compare it to some setup that is controlled. So this to read it to you, a control is a setup that acts as a standard or reference with which results in an experiment can be compared. So a controlled experiment is what we're really after. Always, always, always. Consider your experiment on the most effective fertilizer as an example. All experiments in science must be controlled in order to be valid. When you hear in the news that science says, be really careful because it's really a marketing ploy. Ask yourself if this is a controlled experiment. So the control experiment <clears throat> is a test in which one variable is systematically changed to determine its effect, if any, on a second variable. So we could come up with a question. We could say, who is stronger, men or women? And, uh, mo most of you would immediately, depending on your sex, probably come up with a suggested hypothesis. The problem is, unless we're controlling this experiment, unless we're using men of the same age, uh, women of the same age, men who work out the same with women who work out the same, and a thousand other variables, we're going to have some very skewed data. So for instance, uh, a lot of you would think that men are stronger than women, but what if the man is 92 years old? Is he likely to be stronger than a woman? who's also, say, middle-aged, but happens to be healthy, works out, etc. Not likely. What about a man, then, is who is younger? Is this guy stronger than another woman who, again, lifts weights every day? Not likely. So these are all variables that have to be controlled for. So make sure in any experiment you do, you control all the other variables that are taking place. There's another kind of study, not called an observational study, called a correlational study. 
Correlational study is a scientific inquiry that indicates a relationship between variables without purposely changing or controlling the variables. You just gather data and then look for correlations. So example, of, again, in your textbook, I would encourage you to see page 18 in your text. Um, <clears throat> the danger here is that correlation doesn't imply causation. You cannot simply say that because two things are correlated that one causes the other. So an example might be ice cream sales increase. As ice cream sales increase, the rate of drowning deaths increase. Therefore, and here's our false conclusion, ice cream, ice cream use or consumption causes drowning. And of course, that's a, an absurd conclusion. But again, look at the information. As ice cream sales increase, when do ice cream sales increase? In the summer. What happens in the summer? More people are swimming, more people are at the beach. Therefore, there's likely more drowning deaths. So the fact that one is correlated with the other doesn't mean that it's the ice cream that causes the drowning. How about shoe size and reading ability? <clears throat> Somebody actually gathered data on this and noticed that as the shoe size increases, the reading ability increases. What? So you're telling me that shoe size causes increased reading ability? Think about it. As shoe size increases, what else increases? Age. As you get bigger, you're usually older. As you get older, you're more educated, more experienced, you've learned more, you can read more. So it's got nothing to do with the shoe size, it's got more to do with the person in the shoes. How about going to bed with your shoes on gives you a headache? Somebody noticed they woke up in the morning, they had their shoes on and they had a headache. I don't think it was the shoes that caused the headache. The fact that you went to bed with your shoes on probably meant that you were out far too late and you were probably drinking something that wasn't at all good for your brain. So correlation does not imply causation. So there's different types of correlation. There's positive, there's negative, it's even something if you're collecting data where you have no correlation or negative correlation or positive. So positive correlation indicates a direct relationship among sets of data. An increase in one leads to an increase in the other variable. Graphically, and again, uh, can't overemphasize the importance of graphical representation. Graphical representation allows you to see trends in your data. So in the case of positive correlation, um, we are looking at something that looks like, well, that. Um, I would say a typical example of high positive correlation would be, say, on the x-axis, if we had hours of study time by students. So down here we might have 0 0.5, up here 1 hour, up here 2 hours, and guess what the y-axis would be? The y-axis would be test performance, test scores. You'll notice this is a straight line here. If you draw a line of best fit, and again, don't try to ever make your data fit that line, but it looks like that data actually does follow a line. You can draw a line of best fit and notice that the slope of that line, um, <clears throat> well, let's not worry about the slope right now. Let's just say we have a straight line. We therefore have a positive correlation. How about a negative correlation? A negative correlation indicates an inverse relationship among sets of data. A decrease in one leads to a decrease in the other. So negative correlation, uh, now it's basically the opposite. There's definitely correlation because we have a straight line, but in this case, as we increase the x-axis, the y-axis actually drops in value. So we're very high up here, very low down here. So I'm trying to think of an example where you might see something like that. How about we stick with the test scores? Test scores are really high if somebody has eight hours of sleep. Down here we have one hour of sleep. So again, the less sleep you have, it's very likely you're gonna see something like this and see lower test performance. Um, what is this no correlation? Sometimes you collect data, let's say shoe size <clears throat> and um, reading ability. 
and you don't see any correlation. We just went through a case where, of course, you would see correlation because the shoe size increases as age, as age increases, your reading ability increases. But often, if you collect a bunch of data, you're going to get a whole bunch of random points on a graph of those two variables. There is no trend there. We would say it's very likely there's no correlation, and so be it. Another science process would be called classification. Often in science, you are simply given a whole lot of things to observe, and you begin observing, and you notice that they have certain characteristics in common, certain characteristics that allow you to group them. So classifying is grouping together objects or living things according to the ways they are alike. So often in the past, I would grab a big pile of leaves, and I would throw it on the table, and I would say, classify them. What you would do, of course, is put the ones that have similar margins, similar edges, similar colors, put them together um, and you would be classifying. Classification is hugely important in the biological sciences because you have all this life on this planet. We tend to put things into groups like kingdoms and phylums and orders based on similar characteristics. Often in science you really can't measure exactly. You can't do quantitative data. A lot of reasons for that time or just even the environment. Sometimes it's just good before you can get to the measurement side of things to actually estimate. So estimation is roughly determining the measurement or nature of something. You could count every jelly bean, but it might take you a while. So estimating is not a bad skill either. Measuring, I would say, is probably more important, however. Measuring is giving exact information about the characteristics such as height, length, mass, or temperature. This is as good a place as any to mention that we are in a metric country. When you measure length, height, make sure you're using the metric system. Centimeters, meters, etc. We don't want to hear anything like inches. Same thing with mass. There's no such thing as pounds. We are dealing with grams and kilograms. There's no such thing as degrees Fahrenheit, we are dealing with degrees Celsius. Make sure as well that you know the names of this equipment that allows you to measure. This pan balance would allow you to measure mass. This would digital balance would allow you to measure it probably more accurately. This ruler measures length. <clears throat> you know what this guy does, measures length on route as you walk, for instance, calipers, um, these type of flasks, Erlmeyer flask, would be measuring volume. Graduated cylinders are more accurate ways of measuring volume. This is another caliper, tape measure, on and on it goes, measuring. Sometimes, as you set up your experimentation, you need to take out a prediction. A prediction is using observations made in the past to describe what you think might happen. I think we know what's going to happen to little mouse, unless they're friends, of course. So an example in science might be if I drop a pencil from a height of one meter and I do it ten times, I notice that, wow, every time it goes down, the pencil hits the ground. So for the eleventh trial, I might predict that when I drop the pencil, it's going to hit the ground. So that's a prediction based on past evidence. We call that gravitation. Sometimes you look at data and you try to explain that data. So stating an explanation that results from an observation. You might not be right, but you are trying to interpret data in any experiment. <clears throat> often that data has to be interpreted on the basis of experience. So often where you see this in, in things like optical illusions, um, or even in the use of language. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now will be a tattered weed of small worth held. I won't uh, <clears throat> subject you to the rest of this fine bit of poetry, but what I want you to get from that is that these are just black blotches of ink on a page. We call them letters. The letters combined together we call words point is that what is really happening is light is hitting those pigments. The light is bouncing off those pigments, hitting the back of your eye. From the back of your eye, the retina carries a signal 
Now it's a chemical signal, electrochemical signal, up the optic nerve to your brain, and you interpret that as meaning. And the meaning is somehow, we wouldn't know what that letter W means unless we were in kindergarten and we learned that W means something, right? So all of these symbols on the page really only mean something when that signal goes from the optic nerve to the brain and is processed in the cortex of your brain. How does this relate to inference? <clears throat> Same thing with data like this one. Again, all we have are black blotches on a page. But if you stare at it long enough, you can actually infer that there is an animal on that page. In fact, it's a Dalmatian. And the Dalmatian is sniffing the grass along the curb. There's a tree off to the left. Do you see it? This is his ear. This is his nose. This is, of course, the Dalmatian, his legs, leaves, curb, inference. If you had never seen a Dalmatian in your life, I don't think you could interpret that as a Dalmatian because inference is only possible based on experience. So again, we have this pretty young lady that I married, but if we flip that image upside down, huh, look what she became. Oh, by the way, just making that up. My wife is beautiful then, beautiful now. The point is, it's the same dots on a page. How you arrange those dots makes you interpret it in different ways. Same information, different inference. This is an old classic, of course. <clears throat> a lot of people just see the old hag. A lot of people see the young lady. Um, hopefully you can go back and forth between the two of them. This would be the young lady's nose, her eyelashes. She's coyly turning over her left sh or right shoulder. And this would be her hair. Now, if you want to look at the old hag, the old hag, on the other hand, this is her mouth, a very large nose, and eye, the hag. But again, it's all a matter of inferring that information. Same thing with this data on a page. Are there seven cubes or are there eight? I count them with the black on top. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I count it with the white on the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Something is wrong there. Are there seven or are there eight? There can't be both. And then, of course, <clears throat> many favorite illusions, again, to boggle the mind and somehow make us realize that based on our experience and who we are, we're going to interpret information differently. Do you see three prongs or two? Can you go through the tunnel this way, or can you go through the tunnel this way? Are these faces or a pedestal? Um, one of my classic examples of inference would be being woken up in the morning, about three in the morning, hearing this crash in the kitchen. I run out there, of course, to kill the burglar, and there is my beloved daughter with her hand in a cookie jar. Okay, most of you would say, my beloved daughter is stealing cookies. But based on my experience, I know my daughter to be this honest, sweet young lady. You can come to different inferences based on the actual observation. All we see is her hands in the cookie jar. I think she's probably just counting them. Or she's putting one back. Or she just likes touching cookies. Inference can be dangerous. So we're just about there in these processes. Um, Stating a hypothesis is really important. Before you can really get going on an experiment, you have to have some kind of a educated guess as to what you think might happen. So that's a hypothesis, giving a possible explanation of how something happens in nature. Usually you write them as, if I do this, then this will happen. So this would be an example of a hypothesis. Grass and radishes, grass and radishes are not equally good competitors. Soil has resources, right? Nutrients, minerals. Um, <clears throat> you plant the seeds for grass and radish. One of them is going to compete the other. When planted together, grass will suppress the growth of a radish more than radish suppressing the growth of grass. So you plant these two seeds. The hypothesis here is that the grass is going to overtake the radish growth because it outcompetes 
right. Biomass is just the mass of all the living tissue grown, and if you compare at the end of the experiment, this hypothesis suggests there would be more grass biomass than there would be radish. So your little package has a whole lot of practice with stating hypothesis. If you have any problem with that, make sure you talk to me. So here's one of the obvious ones when you're doing science experiments, carrying out science processes, you're doing experiments. So just to define it, an experiment is all about planning and carrying out a series of activities that help solve a problem or find an answer to a question. Duh. Yep, that's what it's all about. Most of us want to be simply told what to think about things. Um, it's so much healthier if you actually ask questions. My dear grandmother used to tell me that if she poured tea on her plants every two or three days, they would grow much better. I shook my head and thought grandma was entering dementia. Um, she also told me that she would sing to her plants. And when she sang to her plants, her plants would be healthier. And again, being the skeptical young nephew that I was, or niece, certainly was a niece, um, I said, grandma, come on. But then, guess what? I find out that photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide to increase plant growth. So what are you doing when you're singing? You're exhaling CO2 around that plant. So it's actually quite possible that dear grandma, God bless her soul, is actually correct. In science, we often can't experiment with the real uh, objects because they're not really accessible. So we have to build models. So using models is employing an object, a design, or an idea that helps you understand something that can't be observed directly. You really can't get your hands on an atom very easily, and you certainly can't look at the nucleus of the atom containing the protons and the neutrons, or even the electrons. So we draw models, and by the end of this course, you're gonna be very familiar with these diagrams and how to calculate wonderful things based on that information. The same thing with a cell, whether it be an animal cell or a plant cell. Um, we draw models to try to figure out how these different organelles within the cell function together. How does that nucleus actually control what happens in the cell? This, is, this cell is very much a city. It's so interconnected and it's like highway systems carrying out all life processes within this incredibly microscopic bit of life. Of course, one of the things in the nucleus would be the molecule deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. And again, you can look at your own DNA, but basically it looks like a bunch of snot. So to see it in all its glory, you really have to see it in its molecu <coughs> molecular complexity. That's going to take a model. And for those of you that don't like writing anything down, let me tell you that another very important science process is actually recording your data. Uh, for this, you could take notes, you could make up tables, graphs, sketches, reports, mind maps, as long as you have somehow got your data down on paper. There's a lot of sad stories of famous scientists uh, who have carried out incredible experiments, came up with wonderful discoveries, or so they said, but that never were able to repeat it because they never wrote it down. And in science, repeatability is what it's all about. If you come up with a discovery for cancer, um, you don't bring in the caterers and party until other people have been able to replicate your results and repeat them, right? So you better have some very accurate record of just what you did in terms of your variables, hypothesis, etc. So part of recording information um, is also this process of analyzing the data. There's no point in recording all that information unless at some point or out, some point or other you actually sit down and you look at it and you think about it and you yeah try to come up with a conclusion. Time to go home. The last one. So when you look at all that data, you have write it down. Um, experiment with different ways of organizing it. Tables are nice. Graphs are nice. All of these ways of visually seeing the data allow you to interpret it better and come up with yeah, probably a more valid conclusion.